Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Hamlin alumni panel, Navigating the First Months of a New Job. My name is Molly Glovey, and I work in the Alumni Relations Office here at Hamlin, and I'm really excited to be with some fabulous, dynamic, uh, recent grads who are going to talk a little bit about their own experience starting new jobs and what that looks like and advice they might have to share. So with that, I'll ask our panelists to go ahead and share their screen. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to start us out by introducing all of our folks. Uh, and then get going with questions and jump right in. This is very conversational. For those who are joining us, please go ahead and put questions you have either in the chat or in the Q&A. We'll find them wherever you put them. Um, if we bring up an issue that you've experienced or something comes up, don't wait until the end to throw your question in. Go ahead and we'll grab it when we can. Um, I've already mentioned this is homecoming and alumni week. So it is a great time to Think about Hamlin University, come to campus, join an event, uh, walk around campus on Saturday. I hope the weather's gonna be gorgeous. For more information about homecoming, you can find that on our alumni relations website. And with that, I will start us off with some introductions. First, we have Lindsay Bernardi. Oops, sorry, Lindsay. <laughs> First, we have Lindsay Bernardi who is currently an assistant women's basketball coach here at Hamlin. She graduated in 2022 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Education and Digital Media Arts and 2023 with a Master of Arts in Teaching. Prior to coming to Hamlin as an assistant basketball coach, she was the Director of Youth for Faith Formation at St. Thomas More Church in St. Paul. Much of her work in these roles have revolved around connecting with people, engaging in outreach efforts, and creating programming for various audiences. Next, we have Hannah Mitchell, class of 14, who is a donor events manager at Clean Air Task Force and leads in-person, hybrid, and virtual donor events. Her goal is to always ensure an exceptional and engaging experience that fosters deep connection and builds community. Prior to joining the Clean Air Task Force, Hannah was a special events manager down the road in McAllister College her focus there was local, national, and international campaigns, alumni campaigns, and presidential events. She has worked in planning events for prominent speakers, including Marion James, Tan France, Elizabeth Warren, and Nicole Hannah-Jones. And like I said, Hannah is a 2024 alum with a Bachelor of Arts in Communication and a minor in Religion. Next up, we have Peter Olson, class of 2017. And Peter has been working in communication and advocacy for over five years. As a communication and outreach coordinator for the Advocates for Human Rights, he supports partnerships with volunteers, supporters and allies, creating strategies and supportive marketing, communications, and a wide variety of events. Peter has a political science degree from Hamilton University. And finally, our very own Jack Stoltz, class of 2018, who is the Associate Director of Alumni and Employer Relations here at Hamlin. And in this role, Jack works to connect alumni and employers with Hamlin in the efforts of creating internship and job opportunities. Jack graduated from Hamlin with a BA in poli sci in 2018. He also holds an MA in international politics with an emphasis on critical geopolitics from Newcastle University. And prior to coming back home to Hamlin, Jack worked for Brown University as part of their annual giving team. And like I said, if you have questions, go ahead and type them into the chat. You could try raising your hand too, but chat might be easiest. And with that, why don't we start out with our first question? And what I'd like to hear from everybody is just, what do you like most about your current role? Hannah, why don't we start with you? Sure, yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to share my experience and hopefully help other students and transitioning out to the world. Um, I really like working at the Clean Air Task Force and I liked McAllister College too um, because I'm focused on missions. Um, I feel like when I first got out of college, I was just like, I gotta get a job. Um, now that I've been in the workforce for a while, I know what really matters to me. And the Clean Air Task Force is working on you know, solving the climate problem. Um, we're basically accelerating clean technologies as fast as we can and trying to change private and um, 
local sectors to influence the behavior and how we can lower cost of energy so we can hopefully survive <laughs> climate change. Um, so it's huge, obviously, but I also really love my team and my boss. Um, that's something else that has changed over the years of knowing what I need and want and how I need to get support. So I found that and it makes my job much easier and more exciting and happier to be at every day. So um, I'll turn it over maybe to Peter. Yeah, I gotta say um, what I enjoy the most about my current position doing communications and outreach for the advocates for human rights is I get quite a level of uh, flexibility and creative freedom when working in my job. Uh, when I started at the Advocates, they didn't have a uh, dedicated uh, communications department or really any staff who focused on it. So while it was a challenge, I was able to essentially just create the uh, communications uh, projects and uh, coordination just from the ground up. Um, so that's been really rewarding to uh, continue to work on. I'll uh, pass it to John. Thank you, Peter. Um, I would say mine is pretty easy. Uh, the fact that I get to work with uh, Hamlin students, uh, the professors on campus, and get to kind of reach out and connect with alumni uh, who also went to Hamlin is probably the coolest part of the job. I think just hearing everybody's stories about what makes this university so cool and so great Um it's just like, it's just so nice to hear. Um, and so I always like doing that. And kind of similar to Hannah, um, you know, the mission based, you know, the fact that I'm trying to help uh, current students with job opportunities and internship is something that really resonates with me. Um, and so being able to kind of come into the office every day and try and get to those goals is really cool for me. So Lindsay, how about you? Yes, that leaves me. Um, being back at Hamlin is obviously a huge, really exciting part for me. I loved my time here. I was a four-year member of the basketball and track teams here. And so now to be able to come back and obviously share my passion for basketball with people that go to the same institution that I love so much is a huge part. But I think more than that, it's just being able to connect with the players on a really unique level. Um, growing up, I never had a female coach in any sport actually. And so to be able to be that for the current players is one of my favorite things um, and really exciting to me, so. Thank you. So now that we said a bunch of great things, our first question actually is, what were some challenges that you faced right out of college and the first few steps into your professional life? We could go the same order, Hannah, if you wanna start with the hard one again. Yeah. Um, I feel like I found it challenging to establish my own like expectations and needs. Um, it's a lot of just figuring out what your colleagues are doing and how you fit into where they already are, especially being normally the youngest in the office. Um, they already have kind of like preconceived notions of different generations. So kind of sitting back was hard because I wanted to do so much and like change things quickly. Um, but when you're in a corporate environment, which was where I started, you really do have to like play the game and like figure out yourself and where you fit in first. So I think that was really challenging, especially because at Hamlin that you thrive and like they ask you to share, be yourself, come up with new ideas. So it is challenging to be put in a new environment where it's like, oh, I'm the lowest on the totem pole or I'm the newest. So um, just figuring that out took probably like a solid two months before I felt like, okay, I'm going to speak at the staff meeting. Like that sounds kind of weird because in college you speak all the time because it's your colleagues and your professors, but um, it is a different ball game. So navigating that was definitely challenging. I think Peter's next then if we're going in the same order. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's certainly challenging figuring out where you fit when you finally get it, but or get the into the career you at least at the time want to be in. Um, I think for me, it was also challenging because it took me a while to end up in communications again. Uh, my internship while I was at Hamlin uh, involved communications, but I wasn't at that point uh, sure that's what I wanted to actually work in once I graduated. 
But the thing is, after you graduate, there's this sense of, I think a lot of recent grads have a sense of like aimlessness because they've been on this track to graduate for so long that suddenly when you're, you know, free of it, of that track for a second, it can feel almost like it's too much freedom. Like now I'm just spinning around and I don't exactly know where to go. Um, but I think that's honestly like a good thing to feel occasionally. And I think you learn much more about yourself from that. So it's one of those things where, yeah, it might be freaky, but it's good that it's happening. Um, but also that feeling kind of continues when you do start in your career. It's like, well, now I got the job. Well, like, what do I do next? Like, what are next steps? But I think the important thing is when you get your first job is you don't have to worry about those next steps too much. Yeah, I um, will kind of piggyback off of Hannah. Um, I think, you know, going into my first job um, and coming out of Hamlin, where I was in, you know, really involved. I was in a sport, um, a couple leadership positions, um, and then going to kind of an entry level job where you're kind of the bottom rung. Um, I wasn't really totally mentally prepared for that. And so it took, it took me about a year. Honestly, it took me a little bit longer to kind of figure out and manage my expectations a little bit. Um, and I think that's just, you know, taking a step back and trying to change your mentality. Um, and so, you know, I guess it's, you know, when you think about it, it's, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and so it's, everything's not going to come, come to you at once. Um, and I thought it would. And so I had a really kind of a different mentality that I had to really change. Um, and so it took, it took a long time. It took a lot of practice, but you know, yeah. My experience is actually slightly different from that. Um, I came out of school the semester after I graduated, I did my student teaching to get my English uh, teaching license in five through 12. And immediately after I finished that, I got offered a job doing something completely different. And that title, like Molly mentioned, was the director of youth faith formation um, at St. Thomas More in St. Paul. And so I think for me, what I actually struggled with especially entering into this space that I was really unfamiliar with was I totally lacked confidence and there was a lot of imposter syndrome with that. Um, I didn't think I was ready or well-equipped to do a job that they had kind of been trusting me with. And with the title of director, I was the only person in my department, so to speak, if we're comparing you know, the church to corporate America, I was the department. And in those staff meetings, I was expected to come and have these ideas and things to say. And so I think that was actually a struggle for me right off the bat, um, trusting that the people that had trusted me to come into this role actually did trust me to do what I needed to do. Um, but I think the other struggle going into a job, especially when a lot of people that I knew in college are coming off of work study jobs or you know jobs at Target with the direct supervisors, um, when I didn't have someone giving me a you know bullet list of this is the exact task I need you to complete by the end of the day or by the end of the week. It could be a little bit daunting to create work for myself, but just kind of becoming more familiar with my role uh, there and now here at Hamlin too definitely becomes easier as time goes on and you get more comfortable. But the time management piece I think was a little bit different going into the working world. So can you tell us a little bit about how you each went about developing rapport and good relationships with your supervisors? The, you know, the expression is managing up um, and that's a real thing. Can you talk a little bit about how you work with your supervisor? Yeah, I'm happy to start. And I want to just say it's different for everybody. I was literally just talking to my husband this morning who manages people and I don't. And so we were like comparing like, what's your Monday look like? Oh my gosh. So um, it, I just recently had like two of the best bosses I've ever had in my time. So my experience has gotten a lot better. And I think that's just come from me knowing what I need and want before I was trying to tailor myself to what my supervisor's work style was. 
And yes, you have to do that often for your first jobs and for first months. Um, but like if you have friends, if you have a therapist, like figuring out what you need to make your day, like you, you're at your job more than you're sometimes with your family, especially if you similar with school, like if you're out of state or whatnot. So know what you need and try to communicate that. Um, don't expect them to change their style either, though, like try to be flexible with each other. So the reason I get along really well with my boss right now is that we're both Sagittarius's. So I think that helps. <laughs> uh, we have very similar work style and what we like. So we don't like micromanaging. Um, these were questions I asked when I interviewed of like, how do you manage? Um, and so knowing what you need, asking for it, and then making sure you reiterate that in emails and stuff. So like, if someone gives you a 24 hour deadline, making sure you and your boss are on the same page of like, you're okay to email them back and say like, that is too short of a time window. Um, or just making sure that your boss knows when they have to step up for you, I think is the most important because if you're managing someone or you're the one managing up, like knowing where to draw the line, I think is the best way to make sure your communication with your boss doesn't interfere or get into conflict with each other. You should always try to be on each other's team when you're doing any type of project. So um, yeah, it's taken me a long time. So don't like Fred, if you have a bad boss, I will, hopefully my husband doesn't care. He's never had a great boss before. So it's like, it happens. It takes a lot of time. So just hang in there and figure out what you need personally. But yeah. Yeah, I just have to reiterate uh, Hannah's point that uh, you shouldn't expect it to become amazing overnight, your relationship with your supervisor. Um, and this is very basic advice, but just trying to be professional and friendly at the same time. Uh, Again, perhaps easier said than done, depending on who your boss is, but they're just skills that, you know, you, you develop over time as you work. Um, and I think I would also reiterate her point of that these are questions you should be asking during the interview process. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's somewhat of a cliche, but it's important to know how your boss likes to manage before you accept the job or your supposed boss. Uh, before you get the job. And I think knowing that going in helps you kind of build your professionalism around it. Yeah, for me, I I always think about it as being honest with yourself um, and just trying to be yourself as much as possible. Because, um, you know, when you think about it, they hired you because they liked how you were as a person. Um, so just trying to you know, you, you shouldn't change everything about yourself just once you get the first, you know, to your first day. Um, and I think, you know, being honest with yourself and being honest around other people really kind of comes off. Um, and I think that builds a lot of trust, especially with a supervisor, um, a lot quicker than, you know, kind of being malleable. Um but I would say, you know, it does take a, take a long time to figure out kind of how you like to be managed. Um, it's taken me as well a few years and I kind of know how I like to work with people. Um, and so, yeah, exactly to the point uh, where it's not going to happen overnight. Um, and so, yeah. I don't have much else to add to that one. I guess I would just say reliability goes a long way. And it will be easier in the long run if you've been really consistent and really reliable in the short term to be able to have those upfront discussions with a supervisor in the long term, um, whether that's, do I have the free range to say, hey, this deadline is too short or, you know, things like that. So a lot of the little things in the short term really add up in the long term, even as something, uh, something as simple as making it a point to say good morning to them every day, ask them how their weekend was, build and rapport. There's a way kind of like Peter mentioned to be uh, personal and professional at the same time. And I think all those elements really add up. If I could, I'd also like to just uh, piggyback off of uh, John's point about, you know, being honest with yourself. I do think that is like actually a very important point. Um, Obviously, we all act a little different when we're at work than when we're not. That's to be expected. But I think it is important, especially if you're just getting out of school, you're probably going to be applying to a lot of different jobs. 
And sometimes you just got to take what you can get, especially in the beginning. But I think it's always good to be honest with yourself as like, is this actually a place I see myself like, like enjoying working here or at least being able to tolerate it? I've had to apply to many jobs <laughs> right after school. And there were some times during the interview where I'm like, I'm, I know the way I'm presenting myself is professional, but it's not authentic. And this is not something I'm going to be able to keep up once I have this job. So I think it's important to ask yourself, like, do I want this just because it's a paycheck or do I actually see myself like being able to honestly do this job? That's a really good point. I also feel like I should commend Jack um, for answering this question <laughs> since I am his boss. You did a great job, Jack. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I actually want to add a couple things to this too. First, I want to just make a reminder for everybody who may currently not have a great boss or we're all going to have somebody who we don't love to work for in our lives. That's just the way life works. Um, I had a not great boss years and years ago, uh, and I still feel like I learned things from that experience. And it was a very short window of time early in my career. And I still think about the things that I learned from that experience as sort of uncomfortable and unpleasant as it was. Like it stays with me now. Um, the other thing I might add to this too is in addition to being honest with yourself and sort of knowing what you need from a manager, I would also encourage people to think about knowing how much context you need about the workplace around you. I have found that over the years, there is times where I really wanna know the context to a project or a team dynamic or a working relationship. And I find it very helpful to get something done. And I've also had times where I felt like some of the context was distracting to what I just needed in order to meet my goals. So I think that's something to think about in the early days of career as well. All that said, sort of, sort of similar, how did you go about learning the culture of your workplace? And did COVID or work from home change how that looks for you? I wanted to piggyback on Molly's thing really quick of bad bosses make for good interview questions. So <laughs> they always ask you the chat, like, when did you have a challenge? But so it is worthwhile. <laughs> um, so I currently work remotely fully. My company is actually based in Boston, but we're an international company. So um, COVID really was an easy transition for me. Um, McAllister did fully remote, obviously, when things shut down during the pandemic, then went to three times in the office, two times remote, and now I'm fully remote. So I had those, what, two full years to learn what I needed to do to be productive at home, and then realize that I could do my job from home. Um, I think it helps that we're all fully remote, so we're all on the same page. I do have five colleagues that work in the Twin Cities, um, and we do, you know, have, my boss has a Halloween party every year and we'll do a happy hour, but like we don't work together. We only hang out when we want to do like cultural stuff. So that was a new learning experience, but I think it's helpful for me because I then know what my priorities are during the work day versus during outside of work hours and what I need. Um, and it was a lot of figuring out people's ages, to be honest. So who was going to be willing to Teams chat me because they liked doing quick instant messaging? Who did I need to get on a Zoom with because they didn't have capacity in their inbox anymore? Like on a leadership team, you know, their inboxes are overflowing. So it's a lot of one-on-one -on -one being a little chameleon and figuring out what you need to do to be productive in your work setting. But um I'm very flexible, so it was pretty easy for me, but I know as people are now transitioning back to working fully at a school or on, you know, an office setting, um, people have reached out and said, like, how do you do this? And I'm like, I don't know. So would love to hear y'all's answers in case that ever happens for me. <laughs> um, I'd say with, uh, you know, an answer to this question is you can certainly, this is like another thing you can ask during the interview, and it's it's probably a good idea too, but I think you're only going to like authentically really learn the culture of your workplace by just being in it. Um, just, you know, paying attention and being observant is honestly all the, the most advice I can give you. I would say uh, working from home slash COVID has changed this a lot, though. I myself have started two different jobs during the lockdown. 
Um, so that certainly made it interesting. Uh, at my current job now at The Advocates, I didn't physically meet another coworker in person till almost a year into the job. So it was very interesting um, starting a new job while also working from home in the sense that, you know, the, the first day there was that question of like, am, have I started yet? Uh, like, am I, am I working right now? Um, but again, I think that's kind of normal just starting any job, even if you're in the office, there's going to be for quite a while, there will be a lot of thoughts of, I don't know if I belong here slash I don't know what I'm doing. And I think, um, just kind of acknowledging that you're going to feel like that for a while will help you get through it. Yeah, similar, um, similar to Peter, I think, you know, those first couple of weeks taking a step back um, and just trying to be observant as possible. I mean, I mean, almost like studying interactions between people, especially, you know, how supervisors interact with the coworkers and you, um, you know, hopefully you did get a basic sense of it during the interview process, but similar to Peter, I think the only way to truly get a sense of it is to get kind of thrown into it. Um, you know, from the work from home kind of hybrid things, I think um, there's definitely some major pros and cons. Um, you know, I think the benefits of being in an office um, and being around social environments is uh is pretty obvious and we've kind of seen that especially if you know you have kids and and the social interactions that they have at school um but then at the same time the the fact that there is that flexibility that we have with work from home now um i mean it can't be understated honestly um i think it's been kind of a revelation for me the fact that i can you know put a load of laundry in when I'm working at home and, and, and still be able to work, um, is a huge, huge difference for me. I, the, I might just really like doing laundry, but, um, I don't know. Yeah. I think, I mean, it's, it is definitely like two sides to the coin though. Yeah. I think, um, along the same line there with any job that I've held, I pretty much, could tell or knew within the first few weeks of my employment what the culture was like. And it's a lot of the little things that kind of hint toward that. So how people yeah, sign their emails, right? If it's, is it a best comma, Lindsay? Is it sincerely? Is it thanks? Um, things like that, as well as are we all eating lunch together? Are we all in our offices? Do people go out to eat? Do they bring their own? Um, so like I said, along those same lines, it is just kind of getting tossed into it. But I think the observation piece is really important as well as just asking questions. That's one thing that I can say for myself. Um, I feel fairly strong, strong in the ability to ask questions when I'm unsure about things. And for the most part, especially when you've already been hired, people are going to be fairly honest about that type of thing. Even if it's, Hey, do we usually go off site to eat lunch? Do we eat lunch together? What time? How long do you usually take to eat? Things like that. They're going to answer honestly. So on top of just sitting back and kind of observing and getting a feel for it, asking questions is always a great step too. So what tactics have worked or not worked in your efforts in maintaining professional relationships and expanding your network? So kind of a networking question, um, but kind of broader too. What's worked for you and what hasn't worked for you? And thinking about what's worked, um, treating every interaction as an opportunity, um, I obviously do a lot of behind the scenes logistics and event planning, um, work with a lot of different vendors. So anytime good or bad that I've worked with a vendor, I send a handwritten thank you card, one so that they remember that the service they provide me provided me for the event helped. And then if I need someone or something else specific for future events, I have that callback. Um, but making sure the door is always open for attendees. I never know exactly what their background is. If they're a donor, how much money they have, what's their plan for like will giving, like there's endless opportunities 
Um, obviously, you never know someone's story. So just treating every interaction as authentically as possible and making sure that you're being your authentic self too. You don't want to tell someone that you like love outer space and they work for NASA and then they're like, you should come to outer space. Like, no, I don't want to. <laughs> so just try to be yourself and that'll honestly open the door if someone remembers that authentic piece of the puzzle that they're like, oh, I need an event planner for this in the future. My friend's hiring. They'll remember you from that one time. So just be yourself and treat everyone um, with nice, positive energy. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to jump off of that. And at the risk of repeating myself again, just being uh, nice and professional um, really goes a long way. Uh, it's very easy to get added as a LinkedIn connection, but you know, the only thing that's going to actually guarantee you like a callback or someone remembering you and like, putting you up for a job or something is an actual interaction you've had with them. Um, I have I work with a lot of interns and managing them, and this is something I always uh, try to kind of reinforce with them is that it's, it's good to try to make those connections, but if they're not quality connections, it's not really going to mean anything. So maybe instead of adding everybody at your current internship, uh, on LinkedIn, you should maybe try just focusing on like your manager and the people you actually work with day to day would be my suggestion and that you don't need to be, you know, spreading yourself too thin in terms of networking. Yeah, similar to similar to my um, advice on, you know, building rapport with your supervisors, I think being yourself um, first and foremost is really big. A uh, big thing that needs to be hit on, um, not being artificial. Um, you know, people can tell if you're if you're kind of like that. I think, um, and I think the you know the key word when I'm thinking about relationships is kind of maintenance. Um, you know, it's I think of relationships as kind of living things. Um, you know, if you ignore it, it'll die just like a plant. Um, and so, whether that's you know getting coffee with somebody every couple of weeks or even just sending a little email, you know, things like that go a long way. Um, and at the same time, and, you know, I think of it as a two way street. So, you know, you have to give and receive, especially in a professional relationship. Um, and if that, you know, I think that that kind of, it can't just be, you know, one way or the other. So, you know, it's all about mutual beneficial beneficiary whatever yeah whatever that word is yeah i really don't know if i have anything else to add that was all really great um one quote that just or i guess more of a phrase that i heard once and has kind of stuck with me ever since is that your network is your net worth so just that idea that the actual um relationships and connections that you make with people will ultimately impact you in one way or the other, whether that's, you know, big impact or a minimal one. Um, as far as maintaining professional relationships, I think what Jack said is exactly true. Don't be afraid to reach out, even if it's a text message. If you were at that relationship or at that level of relationship with a former supervisor or a former boss or a former colleague, classmate even, just to reach out, check in with people, um, and they'll check in with you. You never really know where that type of thing will lead. So. Thanks, you guys. I'm going to add one to this one, too, that came to mind while you were talking, especially about maintaining those networks um, and being authentic. I've been in experiences before where um, I've interacted with somebody who I could tell needed something, but I don't know that they knew what they needed. And that's what I mean by that is um, it's okay to ask for help, like Lindsay and others have said, um, and it's okay to really, you need to be clear about that. You need to say, um, even if you're jumping over where you're at in a job search process, for example, it's okay to go to somebody and say, um, I'm really looking for some guidance on this particular field, or I'm you know, I'm really uh, trying to discern what I want my next step to be, but bring some specificity so the person isn't uh, sort of trying to figure out what you need from them. Don't have, don't be in a position where they say, 
what do you want? What do you need? And you say, I don't really know, <laughs> but I know I need something. Um, that goes to preparation too. So if you could give your past self some advice, um, whether that past self was a senior in college, whether that past self was your first job, first month in, what kind of advice would you give your past self? I would say that like your first jobs or like what you think is cool doesn't have to be what you do. Um, I worked for a travel agency coming out of college and everyone was like, that is the coolest thing ever. Guess what? I hated it. Like it did not work out. Um, I was just try obviously needed a paycheck too, but like in doing what I thought would be something so exciting and people would be so like proud and you know, excited about, I, it didn't work out for me. So really think about what you want, not what other people will perceive on like a LinkedIn profile as like an awesome, cool company or job. Be like in your heart, do you care about what you're doing? And that will go the longest because you're all you have. So advocate for what you need. I think if I had to give my past self um, some advice, especially right after graduating, I think I would have told myself to calm down a little bit, take a breather. <laughs> um, I ended up, uh, you know, just kind of floating around for a while trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I mean, I literally spent a year as a lumberjack and that had nothing to do <laughs> with what uh, I had studied in Hamlin or the career I ultimately ended up getting into. But I still think it was important and I learned a lot from that. Um, and I think just knowing that you are going to bounce around and that rarely is your first job going to be your forever dream job. And you might never 100% find that forever dream job. I think work uh, can be fulfilling and good, but it, it's always, for a lot of people, it's still going to feel like work. And I think kind of coming to that understanding, especially when you're you know, just fresh out of school. And now you're like, oh, it's time for dream job. It's time to get the career I've always wanted. Um, knowing that that's probably going to change quite a lot uh, after you graduate. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I would say kind of going back to um, the first question, I think managing your expectations is uh, the biggest thing that I would have told myself. I'd would have been like, you know, these first two years aren't really going to be super fun like you think they're going to be. Um, and maybe that was just my personal experience. But um, and I think, yeah, I mean, just preparing as much as you can while you're at Hamlin, for sure. Um, I I didn't, you know, I didn't go to the CDC um, and things like that. I feel like I think that would have helped a little bit um, if I would have thought about it a little bit more um and i think if i can give two i think being you know knowing that it's okay to make mistakes um especially early on in your career um you know not everybody has all the answers um like your bosses and you know they're human too so they'll make mistakes as well and you know it's just kind of how we do it um but yeah managing your expectations and and being okay to make mistakes here and there is goes a long way. For me, I think I would just say be open to change and the opportunities that are presented, um, even if they're unexpected. And even if, again, that imposter syndrome kind of kicks in a little bit, if an opportunity is being presented to you, then there's a reason for that. And there's a question here in the chat that kind of ties into that. So it says, I know for most people, what they study and what they uh, complete their degree in are totally different than their current job. Do you feel like your degree helps you with your current job or did you take a different path that's straight away from that? And I think for me, while objectively speaking, what I'm doing and what I have done has veered off a lot. Um, my degree, education, digital media arts, I'm not a graphic designer. I'm not a teacher in a classroom, but what I learned at Hamlin and what I completed in my time there and what I did to kind of obtain those degrees has trickled into my work life in all aspects. So when I was working at the church, I was working with youth. I was 
not traditionally teaching them things, but I was still like teaching them a different type of content and in a less formal setting. Um, and as far as the digital media arts things, for me at least, that's been a huge part of what I do as far as outreach in both jobs. And the same thing is here at Hamlin. I'm a coach that is teaching just in a little bit different of a way. So in my opinion, regardless of your major, whatever degree you get, there are going to be elements of it that do kind of infiltrate their way into whatever career you eventually end up having. Um, and a career isn't necessarily forever, right? You can have, you can start your career in one place and you can still be in a career. You can still have a career in a totally different sector. So especially with Hamlin's, you know, the Hamlin plan, the liberal arts idea and things like that. Um, there are always things to be pulled from whatever your major was that are applicable to the future job that you have in any given field. If I may also take a shot at uh, answering this question in the chat about, you know, how useful is your degree? Say, regardless of what your degree is, it should also be teaching you responsibility to yourself. And I think that's going to help you in whatever career you end up in. Um, because, you know, you're not in high school anymore. No one generally is making you get a college degree. It's something you are choosing to work towards. And that's also going to follow you once you're, you know, working, once you've graduated, wherever you're working, is that job is now a responsibility you're taking on. It might not be one you want to have for the rest of your life, but there's still a certain responsibility you owe to yourself to, uh, you know, put what you want into the job and try to take out what you want from it as well. Jack, Hannah, you want to take a shot at that one? Yeah, I, I, I would say, you know, it, it definitely does help um, in the sense that, you know, like Lindsay said, the liberal arts education piece um, really does kind of affect your worldview. Um, and maybe it's just because political science is such a broad, um, you know, field that we're, you know, it, it, it just affects how I, how I view, um, relationships, um, you know, situations that are going on. Um, I mean, it affects, you know, we're looking at job markets, um, and those are all things that are kind of societal things that go on, um, and in, my time here at Hamlin and doing political science that kind of affected that way that I view the world. And even when, I mean, I have a master's in international politics, I'm not doing diplomacy work. Um, but I think I'm still doing, um, some really good stuff here too, but yeah, I, I mean, it definitely straight away, but, um, all those things definitely helped in just more abstract ways, I guess, than, you know, certain degrees. Yeah, I would reiterate, I definitely use my communications degree, obviously sending invites, face-to-face -face interactions at events, but the thing it taught me most was just like how to people, like understanding interpersonal relationships, how all of us are interconnected in that worldview. So anything like poli sci, comms, uh, psych, any of that is all helpful with a liberal arts degree, because I do think you get into your specific job, but really it's the people and the mission that will drive everything else. So if it doesn't align with your degree, I can't, I feel like years, probably five years ago, people stopped asking me about college during interviews. Like it does drop off and they just want to know about your work experience and how you view and interact with people so that you can drive the overall goals. So if you stray from it, it's fine. It always comes back in some sort of way. So yeah, I would say some of the most successful people that I've worked with, managed, worked for, interacted with, um, are clear communicators and are curious. And I think no matter what you study in any environment at the collegiate or grad school level, um, you're going to learn how to be a clear communicator and you're going to at least get to practice what it feels like to be curious. And I think if you stop being curious at your job, then that's probably a, that's probably a sign in and of itself. Um, so there are things that you learn, right. Outside of 
what you're learning. Does anybody have any last words? Any motivational? I'm just kidding. Does anybody have anything else they want to share for the audience before we wrap it up? Uh, I've noticed a point that all of us seem to keep hitting on is about being, you know, authentic to yourself and presenting yourself authentically, which I 100% agree with. I guess just to anyone listening who's sure to understand that you're still at work. So you're never going to be 100% who you are personally. There's definitely going to be work you, but as long as you're happy with work you, I think that's the important part. I would work, say work you shouldn't drain your energy, right? <laughs> Yeah, build the support within your friends. I think a lot of people don't want to talk about work, but um, knowing that your friends and family go through the same things and just if you need to vent or anything, um, it is helpful in your journey to be open and authentic with your support network so that you can show up as your best self every day. Lindsay, Jack. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, you guys. I really appreciate your time. Um, and a reminder for all of us that we'll put this up on our alumni YouTube channel so people can find it later. Um, and thanks so much. I hope you uh, learned a lot today. I learned today uh, and I look forward to uh, seeing everybody again. Thanks, you guys. Bye.